Welcome back to Sister Circle Live. Selena and I recently had an opportunity to sit down with a man who's been a beacon of light to the broken and as an author, reality TV star, and leader of Relentless Church in Greenville, South Carolina, Pastor John Gray. We discuss everything from his controversial visit to the White House to his fashion choices. Let's take a look. I wanted to step it up because yes. you guys are always fabulous. So yes. I'm, Thank I'm hoping you kindly. to compliment well, the beauty. Yes. Well, you matched your shoe with your book. Yes. Uh, I did. Yeah. <laughs> Damn. Huh? What are you doing? You got to get the book yes, now and the shoe. And the socks. The, and the socks? socks. Yes. Else. Yes. Okay. yes. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, we'll get into the book a little bit later, but let's right. talk about this newness in your life. Of yeah. course, you just wrapped another season of the book of John Gray, mm -hmm. your pastor of a new church. Um, how would you best describe your life? life right now oh wow um, hectic hmm. um, uh, packed um, and and purpose filled and so for me I believe that God purposed me to do what I'm doing right now so even though my life is filled I have a lot of peace mm -hmm. because I'm doing what I'm called to do you you were pastoring at Joel Osteen's church mm -hmm. like co-pastoring but now you are a senior pastor at your own church yes relentless church what has that transition been like for you well you know being an associate pastor with Pastor Joel, and I still have that role. Oh, okay. I still go okay. each month, a few times a month, mm -hmm. uh, to do midweeks and then some weekends. Um, but there's a distinct difference between preaching and pastoring, because when I'm preaching, my job is to just give the word of God, and then you know you've got structures in place. But when you're a senior pastor, now you have to live inside the vision. You've got to build teams. You've got to manage personalities. Yes. You've got to speak to people's insecurities and still get the best out of them while yes. nursing my own insecurities my and fears. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's so it's work. And sometimes I don't feel adequate. And I think that's exactly why God uses me because yeah. I, I don't lean on me. I, I don't have it by yeah. myself. I need him. Right, mm. right. Uh, speaking of leaning on God, uh, a lot of people even question this uh, thing that you did with President Trump. Mm -hmm. um, you got a lot of backlash from that, a lot of criticism mm -hmm. in the meeting with inner city pastors. Yeah. Would you have changed that decision and did anything good come from that? Thank you for the question. Let me give context because context is key. When the invitation first came, it was, we need pastors from churches who are willing to have a conversation about ending recidivism in African-American and underserved communities. Mm. That was the invitation. Okay. It was also, how can we help to uh, reacclimate nonviolent offenders and perhaps get them jobs and education? That was the invitation. None of that was in the sound bites you see. Okay. So it's important to understand what I was understanding the meeting was for. Okay, gotcha. I do now know in hindsight that it was a place for a visual, and it was a visual not even for the African American community, mm -hmm. it was for his base. Wow. Mm -hmm. uh, I understand that, I didn't then. I believe that I was sent there as a man of God and I had an opportunity off the camera to say some things that needed to be said. And I was in the middle of something I had no clue about. My heart was pure. Mm -hmm. And you don't go in there saying, I can't wait to be popular. Right. You go there because you really, and I genuinely believe, yeah. God said, go, because that affects me. I got cousins in jail. Mm -hmm. I've had uncles in jail. My father was in jail the day I was born. Mm -hmm. So those were things that speak to me. If I can help other uh, African-American men particularly, have an opportunity to get free or to get a second chance, then I wanted to have that conversation. Mm -hmm. But it was not uh, a fully actualized conversation. Now you're saying hindsight would I go again. I'll simply say this, I've been invited back a number of times and it's not the proper occasion. And with everything that's going on in our, in our country and the, you know, everybody's emotions are so tender, mm -hmm. how, you, but they still feel like the church is missing the mark. Mm -hmm. How do we rectify this? Mm -hmm. If not going and speaking to the president himself is not working, right. what do we need to do? Well, if you look at the model of Dr. King, which was nonviolent social change, he took the principles of scripture and married them to justice and social justice activism. You cannot disengage or divorce social justice from the scripture. 
You mm -hmm. cannot do it. So where people would say, oh, you're just pro-black. No, I'm not pro-black, I'm pro-justice. Mm -hmm. So when unarmed African-American men are being killed by cops, I got a problem with that. And here's the thing, if it was unarmed white women being killed by cops, I'd have a problem with that yes. if it was disproportional. Yes. That's the key. And that's not what's being said because the dog whistles are, if you say something against cops, you hate all cops or you hate government, it's not true. I don't have a I don't have a problem with authority. I have a problem with people who abuse authority. Yes, yes. And just because somebody does a crime doesn't mean you get to shoot them and kill them. Right. They get due process of law, period. And we see the record that unarmed African American men are being killed at at rates that are disgusting, and people who mass murder are taken in with no scratches. Yeah. What, what can, where does the church, what can the church do, though? Is there a role that, that is specific to the church that, well, can, that we can help? Change? I don't know if the church is ready to hear what I have to say, but I'm going to tell oh, y'all and act like they're not listening. The church is going to have to reconcile with itself mm -hmm. because there's two different Jesuses, apparently. There's the... Can you say that? Can you, like, break the two different Jesus' Jesus's part? Yeah, there's the white evangelical Jesus, who's Republican. Mm -hmm. Then there's the black Jesus, who's Democrat. And Jesus was neither. Jesus was spirit, and he was a monarch, so he didn't vote. Whoa, okay. Whoa. Wow. He's getting deep. He yes, gets it, he's it gets he real. He continues to get it popping. Yes, yes he does. I'm yeah. actually, uh, first of all, I want to definitely know what's going to be said next. Oh, yes. But I, I do, I'm very happy that he had the opportunity to express what that invitation noted when he yeah. was going yeah. to the White House to yes. clear the air with that. I'm yes. really proud that we afforded him that opportunity. Unfortunately, he was used, like many other African American men, for a photo op. Yes. And now we know that. I yes. think now Steve Harvey might, and then you can start to think of like the other African Americans that went to the, to the to the White House with good intentions, they probably went through the same concepts. Yeah, so like, we really man, shouldn't judge I, them. Right, yeah, I could be really. the one to help change. Right, like, you can kind right, of go in with right. that mindset, and then you realize, oh my God, this was truly a photo op. Yeah, yes. instead of sitting and talking, Sister Circle, we'll go down to the White House. <laughs> you got something to say, too. You got something to say, right, something right. Say. And I really love the fact that you, when you asked him about, you know, what the, can the church do mm -hmm. and how he broke it down. I'm still yeah. waiting for him to continue to break it down. Oh, my oh. goodness. I'm saying it was good. Child. It's real good. Just, we have to, like, literally come together. I was literally was riding fun. down the street yesterday and mm -hmm. just looking at all the different churches and Martin Luther King said it best it is the most what uh, segregated hour of uh, on Sunday or in America mm, yeah. on Sunday mornings like, we don't oh, worship together deep. we don't we don't do anything together but we're trying to go for one goal and love that's not that's it'll never happen yeah. it'll never happen so we'll continue the conversation coming up welcome back to sister circle live we just showed you all the first part of Rashawn and Selena sit down with pastor John Gray and if you thought that was something part two is really going to blow your mind let's take a look <laughs> What was the decision to write this book about um, the inside of a person, winning from the inside? Because the external trappings of success have uh, given us rose-colored glasses to what we think will give us peace. But if money could give you peace, and if cars and houses could give you peace, then wealthy people wouldn't commit suicide. Mm -hmm. And people who are on TV wouldn't be taking antidepressants because fame and money and things do not give you peace. Hello, some Bye. Bye. Yeah. And so when I looked at my own life, <clears throat> this idea of win from within, finding yourself by facing yourself, um, the truth is, as big as I am, I'm a marathon runner. I might not run in the natural, but I've been running in the spirit my whole life. I've been running from the things that I'm afraid of. I've been running from the things that have been stalking me in my fears and in my nightmares, areas of insecurity, areas where I don't feel adequate as a husband, as a father, as a leader. And I was tired of living, running away from the things that I was scared of. And so I needed to face it. Yeah. And, it, and, it and it didn't start in a pulpit. Mm -hmm. I had to face it at home. I got this woman that loves me, but she married a broken man, and she didn't know how broken, because I didn't know how broken. Because right. when you're single and you, and you can lie to yourself, it's easy to love what you see. Mm -hmm. But then when you live in community with another person, all of the masks begin to crumble. So now my wife is left with a picture of a shadow of a man that she thought she knew, and now I'm dealing with the unintended consequences of not healing properly from sexual abuse or not having the proper information on how to foster intimacy or what it means to be uh, a Christian and a black man and a single, the child of a single parent and not know what it means to build your house. So now I'm trying to be a husband and a father and a leader and I didn't see any of those up close. Mm. So how can you be what you've never seen? Ooh, message. So now I'm running blind scared out of my mind, crying most nights, and I'm tired. 
And so I said, I wonder how many other people have been faking it. And many of us are weary, weary. And I said, I don't know how long I'm gonna live, but whatever it is, I'm gonna turn around and fight this thing. So, you know, Win From Within is about uh, identifying the areas in your life that need healing so that you can be what you need to be for you first and then everybody else. Yes. Is this, because I'm thinking this is the exact quote uh, that you were referring to, speaking about blind, blind ambition, mm-hmm. uh, so much of what we call ambition is really a response to the things that are absent in our lives. What can the process in identifying the voids in our life look like? Is that what you were speaking yes. to, and how can we fill those voids? Yeah. See, blind ambition means I'll do anything to get to a particular goal, no matter who I hurt and no matter what it costs. There is a healthy ambition that says, I'm gonna put a plan together, I'm gonna work towards the goal. But blind ambition says, you know, damn it all, I'm going after it and I'm gonna take it and no matter who I kill or who I injure, I'm, I'm going after it. And so for me, the idea of ambition and ministry don't mix, because I don't work for me. I work at the request of a king. There's a quote that really sat with me that I wanted to ask you about, and I'm gonna read it. It says, the men in my family were not anything to emulate. So in terms of how I would need to define myself, being a mama's boy was the only chance I had of breaking that cycle. Absolutely. If I was gonna become like the men in my family, then addiction and bad decisions and all types of other vices would have been my life. It's very clear my bloodline and it's in my DNA. So <clears throat> what I want to know is, has being a mama's boy affected you in your relationships beyond your, with your mom oh. and in your marriage? Absolutely. And what can we do or what can men do to break these cycles that are generational? First of all, breaking generational cycles, I just want to say this. There are demons you inherit and then there are demons you invite. I can see decisions I've made. I fight against the nature of who I am. My mother somehow was able to break that mold. But of course, when you're close to your mama and you don't know how to do all the things that everybody else is doing, what are you, a sissy, you gay? What are you, a punk? Mm -hmm. So I got bullied and talked about and all of that. But she was my only chance. My mother was my only chance at manhood. My mother was instrumental in, in guiding me to make wise decisions. The wife that I chose is better than the man that I am. I married a woman two sizes too big. I have to grow into Aventer. She's a coat. I still can't fit her. She's bigger than me. And she's had to cover me while I grow up. I gotta grow into her. But she's a covering. She's a covering, not a lid. Because if a man marries a lid, she'll stop your dream. But if you marry a covering, she'll push you to your destiny. Now, I'm about to shout and tear this whole Let thing up. <laughs> I'm just telling you. Let me tell you something. My, my wife has endured more pain birthing me than both of our children. She has sacrificed these last eight years uncovering the painful areas of my manhood and covering the areas that could have exposed me. She deserves anything I can give her. You understand what I'm saying? Yes. I'm going to live the rest of my life to honor her because she gave me what I couldn't give myself, which is a chance to heal while still seeing the God in me. Before we let you go, um, there's one more thing that we want to identify in your book, and it is the Lord, the model, the mirror, and the moment. Can you break that down for our viewers? The model, the mirror, and the moment. The model is where you were raised. That's the place where you get your core information. The mirror is the moment where all that information starts battling with what you believe you're called to. So now you're looking at yourself and you're looking at your factors that determined some of the things that were outside of your control. But the mirror says, I now have to face my nature and my nurture versus the calling. And when you look in that mirror, then you come to the moment. And the moment is, do I die right here or do I fight for what I'm called to become? First of all, the way that you put words together is just just impeccable, phenomenal, um, which clearly states and is clearly evident that you're supposed to be exactly who you're supposed to be. That's number one. Um, I just wrote a book called The Wait Is Over, W-E-I-G-H-T. Yes. My journey of loving myself from the outside in. But the, the mirror, the moment, the, the, model. the model, the mirror, in the moment reminds me of this. When I was writing the book, I thought that I was okay. You know, oh, I could write about this stuff. That's the past. But I fell into a depression because of what, it, what I realized that it was, I wasn't done with. Jesus. So I went, to, I went into a whole deep depression. Now, when you were writing your books, and even writing this one, 
Did you go through anything similar to that where you <laughs> felt like, oh my God, I thought this stuff was done, and now here it is again, and I'm reliving the pain. This book was supposed to come out last year, but I couldn't write what I hadn't lived, and it hurt to write that book. Mm -hmm. That's why I, I'm, I'm afraid of failure, and the devil lies to me and says nobody wants to hear what I have to say, so I don't promote, but I'm pushing this book because I know what I went through to get it out of me, so I want people to get win from within, not because I want book sales, yes. but I want you to heal. Mm, our time with Pastor John Gray is still sitting with me days after. Wow. You can pick up his new book, Win From Within, online and wherever fine books are sold and on Audible. Yes. I listen to it. Me Audio too. book. Absolutely.